of uh, the Institute of Theoretical Physics, UNESP, uh, also with the CTP SAFER. So this is the time when uh, we take advantage of our invited lecturers of activities here at the CTP SAFER to ask uh, some of them to give uh, some more general talks for the, this is uh, repeating. Uh, no, that's okay, I think, I, can you take the sound off maybe? Otherwise, I reckon ask. Um, anyways, um, right, so, uh, so we invite some of the lecturers to give a colloquium uh, for the general uh, IFT community. So it's our pleasure to have today uh, Professor Mikhail Shaposhnikov, and he goes by Misha, so I think it's okay, right, Misha? Uh, so Misha, uh, he did his PhD uh, at the Institute for Nuclear Research. Can you do it, Misha, or should I? I can call. Tiago? Tiago, tá dando um eco ali na, na máquina dele? Tá dando um eco na máquina, acho que você tem que mutar alguma máquina lá. Sorry about that. So we are, we are broadcasting Zoom, that's why we have this uh, echo. But I will continue. So Misha got his uh, PhD from the Institute for Nuclear Research of the Russian Academy of Sciences. And, and then he worked, from, uh, he worked at, as, as a junior scientist at uh, the theory division of this institute. And also he was a staff member of the, of the CERN, uh, the theory division of CERN. And in 1998, uh, he was appointed a professor of theoretical physics at the University of Lausanne. And in 1999, he became a director of the Institute of Theoretical Physics at Lausanne. And since 2003, he's a professor at, uh, at e e EPFL, and he leads the Laboratory of Particle Physics and Cosmology, but he's now an emeritus uh, professor um, at, uh, there. So Misha has uh, got many prizes. Uh, among them, he is a recipient of the Andrei Sakharov Gold Medal, which is awarded by the Russian Academy of Sciences. And in 2005, he was awarded with the Markov Prize for Fundamental Physics. So with uh, Vadim Kuzmin and, uh, and, and Rubakov, Valery Rubakov, uh, Misha wrote one of the uh, uh, most influential papers in electroweak biogenesis in 1985, and he's an expert in many areas uh, of physics and cosmology. So without further delay, uh, I will pass the word to Misha. So thank you, Misha, for accepting uh, to give the colloquium. <coughs> uh, one more thing. We're going to have the group picture of the conference after the colloquium outside, okay? So don't go for coffee immediately. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, uh, Roger. Uh, <laughs> I uh, very pleased to be here. Uh, it's indeed enjoyable uh, place to be uh, benefiting from hospitality of uh, uh, different people here. So thank you very much. Uh, so what uh, I will uh, uh, talk here, I will talk about uh, baryon asymmetry of the universe and particular uh, why uh, we consider uh, baryon asymmetry of the universe as uh, a window for uh, physics beyond the standard model, a window for uh, new physics. So what uh, I will do today, I will start from some uh, historical overview, how this problem evolved and uh, where uh, we are today. And then I will uh, tell you how to create uh, baryons in the universe, uh, considering uh, several uh, plausible uh, possibilities. Okay, so uh, the main question uh, in this domain is uh, why uh, the Earth, the solar system, and our galaxy uh, consists of matter and uh, not of antimatter. So why we don't see any traces of antimatter in the universe uh, except those where antiparticles are produced in collision with uh, ordinary particles. So this fact uh, looks uh, uh, pretty much bizarre because uh, if we look at uh, the properties of matter particles and antimatter particles, they are very much similar to each other. Particles and antiparticles have 
the same masses, they have different uh, charge, but uh, otherwise they are uh, they look to be uh, identical. Okay, so uh, the problem I'm going to talk about did not exist before 1930. Why? Because before 1930, antimatter was not known. The only particles uh, which we knew existed uh, in the universe and around us uh, were protons, neutrons, electrons, and uh, photons. Okay, so after this uh, date, uh, anti-electron was discovered, uh, positron, and it's actually interesting to see uh, what people uh, thought about that around this time. So, in particular, uh, Dirac, who uh, predicted the existence of uh, positron, and uh, his Nobel lecture in 1933 uh, presented a picture of the universe, which was 50% uh, consisting of matter and 50% consisting of antimatter. And he was telling that perhaps somewhere uh, far from us, uh, we have anti-Earth, anti-stars, anti-galaxies, etc., uh, etc. Et okay, and uh, the reason uh, why he says so was because uh, at that time uh, different symmetries, which uh, existed in particle physics, such as uh, C symmetry, when you replace particle by uh, antiparticle, were uh, believed to be exact. So. The, the, the exactness of uh, this symmetry, such as parity or uh, charge conjugated uh, uh, symmetry, it was uh, challenged uh, later on in different experiments. So first, uh, the uh, breaking of uh, uh, C and P uh, was discovered in uh, weak interactions, but still uh, people were reluctant to accept that uh, the world of particles and antiparticles are different. So, in particular, uh, Landau came out with a suggestion that, okay, well, C is broken, uh, parity is broken, but uh, there is a combined symmetry, CP, in which you replace particle by antiparticle and you change uh, simultaneously the direction of coordinate. This combined symmetry is exact uh, symmetry of nature because it's kind of strange. You look in the mirror and get something uh, different. So, what uh, uh, Landau proposed happened to be wrong. Uh, again, it was challenged by uh, uh, experiments. And uh, uh, so the, the cr uh, crucial experiment here uh, was uh, uh, the discovery uh, of uh, CP violation in uh, decays of uh, neutral uh, K mesons, okay? particles with the mass about 450 uh, MeV. And uh, in this case, after this uh, was discovered, it was clear that uh, matter and antimatter are indeed different. And the measure of this difference between matter and antimatter in CP violation of K mesons was kind of big. It was of the order of 10 to the minus 3. So the difference in, 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 in the reactions uh, with uh, uh, particles and antiparticles was at the level of uh, 10 to the minus 3. So, simultaneously with this uh, uh, developments in uh, particle physics, uh, there was uh, a mountain evidence that if you look at the universe, that uh, the direct picture of the universe consisting 50% of matter and 50% uh, of antimatter is most probably wrong, because we didn't see a substantial amount of antinuclear e cosmic rays, we didn't see uh, annihilation of matter and matter uh, 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 coming from uh, distance uh, places in uh, our galaxy and, well, and beyond our galaxy. And it uh, all changed, uh, I would think, uh, around 65. Because uh, at this time, there was uh, a new uh, discovery, a discovery of uh, the cosmic microwave background which uh, told us uh, that in the past, uh, the universe was hot and it was in thermal equilibrium. Okay, so why uh, this was uh, very important for uh, our problem, of problem of baryon asymmetry, because it allowed us 
to uh, relate the experimentally observed baryon to photon ratio. You take the total number of baryons in the universe, you divide by total number of photons in the universe. This is a number known experimentally of the order of 10 to the minus 10. With the help of uh, Big Bang Theory, uh, we can relate this number to baryon asymmetry of the early universe. When the temperatures were high enough, uh, the, uh, the particles like protons uh, were uh, uh, present uh, in abundance. Okay, so uh, this quantity, number of baryons minus number of antibaryons divided by its sum at temperatures of the order of 1 GV is nothing but the ratio of number of baryons to number of photons now, and this is 10 to the minus 10. And uh, well, here the sign is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's another way around. Uh, the CP violation, which we have uh, uh, in uh, CP uh, violating K methods, is 10 to the minus 3. So, in a sense, the CP violation, which uh, we had uh, in the early universe, is much, much smaller than that uh, which we have in, that we observed in particle physics. So, maybe uh, there is a, a nothing spectacular uh, in, in baryon asymmetry. Well, here is uh, the picture uh, which shows how uh, this baryon asymmetry evolved in time. So this is time, uh, this is the baryon asymmetry at uh, the beginning uh, of the universe, at early times, uh, there was uh, a tiny uh, asymmetry of the order of 10 to the minus 10. Uh, you can think that there were 10 to the 10 uh, uh, pairs of uh, baryons and antibaryons and one extra baryon. Then this symmetric background uh, annihilated into photons and neutrinos uh, eventually at a temperature of the order of uh, 100 MeV or so. And then this 10 to the minus 10 uh, was converted into, uh, into one. Okay, and that's a very important number uh, because it tells us how many baryons we have in the universe. It provides us a building material for uh, stars, planets, uh, humans, etc., etc. Okay, so uh, uh, looking at that, uh, we uh, would like to understand better from where uh, this uh, symmetry may uh, can hum come from. Uh, why the universe at all contains uh, more uh, baryons than uh, antibaryons, and uh, how to compute this asymmetry from uh, different fundamental uh, principle of physics. Uh, okay, so the uh, first paper uh, on this subject appeared uh, back in uh, 67 in uh, the work of uh, Andrei Sakharov. Uh, Read the abstract. It's actually an interesting uh, abstract, and let me point out uh, an interesting uh, uh, thing in, in this abstract. So he, he says that uh, C asymmetry, uh, C asymmetry, he has in mind exactly baryon asymmetry of the universe. So it's a consequence of violation of CP invariance in non stationary expansion of the hot universe. Uh, uh, during super uh, dense stage as manifest in the difference between the partial probabilities of the charge conjugated reactions. Okay, so he said this effect has not been observed experimentally, but it has been exper <laughs> observed experimentally three years before in uh, the case of uh, uh, K methods. But, okay, perhaps he didn't know about that. Uh, uh, so, uh, right now, uh, uh, this uh, a little bit cryptic uh, uh, statements uh, are formulated as uh, three uh, Sakharov conditions for uh, for baryogenesis. Uh, first, you should have uh, baryon number non conservation to produce uh, baryon number. So you, you imagine that uh, at the very beginning, the number of baryons was the same as the number of antibaryons. So we need that uh, clearly. Uh, C and CP violation to have difference between particles and antiparticles that you see explicitly here, and uh, departure from thermal equilibrium, and this is exactly uh, the error of time uh, Sakharov was uh, talking about. Okay, so at this time, of course, there were 
uh, no ideas from where baryon number node conservation can come from, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that was a, a really pioneer and outstanding statement because at that time everybody believed that baryon number is conserved. Okay, and uh, Sakharov had some model how uh, this asymmetry uh, can be produced. He was thinking about some particles which are uh, were called uh, maximons introduced by Markov, another uh, Soviet physicist. So these particles had the mass of the order of the Planck scale, 10 to the 19 GeV, 10 to the minus 5 grams. And so he saw that these particles will decay and uh, produce uh, baryon asymmetry of the universe. Okay, so th the next paper on, on this subject appeared uh, three years ago by uh, uh, Vadim Kuzmin. So this work is well, less known than uh, Sakharov's uh, work. And uh, he went further and he tried to uh, propose a particle physics model which uh, can explain uh, baryon asymmetry. Uh, of the universe without uh, reference to any maximons. And so he uh, uh, said that the source of asymmetry is the case of new Majorana fermion with mass of around one TV or more. So this is a prototype of uh, uh, to what is called today uh, leptogenesis. Well, another thing which uh, he uh, addressed is that uh, he wanted to say that uh, CP violation, which we see and already discovered in particle physics in K mesons, may be related to CP violation in baryon number non-conservation. And if that were the case, that would be a spectacular thing. Then you take your particle theory, you do some uh, computation, and then you predict the sign of baryon asymmetry. Sign meaning that, okay, we have baryons and not antibaryons. And, uh, uh, yeah, he, he has also a proposal of resonant uh, baryogenesis, which is also explored uh, right now, in which the uh, reactions with CP violation are enhanced when you have particles with masses close to each other, because he has the, this analogy associated with the K0 uh, uh, decays, and he also had a proposal to search for neutron anti neutron oscillations, which are uh, doing, uh, which are people doing uh, till now. Well, they were not found, but, um, uh, but that's what he had in, uh, in his seminal paper. Okay, so these works were completely ignored by, the, by everybody, okay, until uh, 78. Uh, two papers uh, appeared. So one uh, was the paper, uh, again, by Vadim Kuzmin, Tavkhelidz, Krasnikov, and uh, Ignatiev. And there was yet uh, another paper by uh, Motohiko uh, Yoshimura. Okay, so in this work, uh, they tried to construct a particle physics model which uh, describes baryon asymmetry of the universe, and it was uh, based on some extension of the standard model. And in uh, uh, Yoshimura paper, uh, uh, yet an extra step uh, was done. So at that time, uh, around 75 uh, or so, or maybe even before, uh, there were new theories constructed, uh, grand unified theories. Okay, so the idea behind was that weak, strong, and electromagnetic interactions are unified in uh, some bigger group. And once you do so, uh, it, uh, so in the standard model, quarks and leptons are in the different multiplets of the standard model. But in grand unified theories, uh, quarks and leptons are in the same multiplets of uh, grand unified theory. And that means automatically that baryon number of uh, is not conserved. So this is a very appealing hypothesis, which uh, also lead to understanding that the gauge couplings uh, uh, get together at high energies, etc., etc. And so uh, Yoshimura uh, took this theory, SU5, and uh, said that, okay, this theory leads to uh, baryon asymmetry of the universe. Okay, and uh, uh, it's kind of interesting that Yoshimura paper was doubly wrong. Okay. 
So first, it uh, was wrong because uh, he got uh, baryon asymmetry and thermal equilibrium. He said, yeah, we have thermal equilibrium, we, we do computation, we get non-zero baryon number. Uh, secondly, it was wrong because if you even accept, if, if, even if you take uh, a more correct computation and do everything in uh, thermal uh, non-equilibrium, you find out that the number which you get is very, very, very small because there are different uh, consolations. So this is like a number which I was showing today in the lecture about electroweak theory. So uh, there are plenty of consolation in, in this theory. But uh, uh, what happened is that uh, these two worked. These two works uh, actually increased a lot of uh, uh, interest of, uh, on the subject. And so after uh, 78, there were uh, many, many, many hundreds of uh, papers looking at, uh, at this problem because this also uh, reveals a very uh, non-trivial relationship between uh, particle physics and, and cosmology. Okay, and uh, the progress is uh, kind of enormous uh, at this time. So basically, you take some particle physics model, you put it in expanding universe, then you do uh, computations, and then you get the answer. Okay. The uh, uh, first question, which uh, appears here, is of course about the standard model, whether uh, we can get uh, uh, baryon asymmetry of the universe in the standard model. And uh, yeah, I will tell you what the answer is. But uh, the, uh, uh, the non-trivial uh, part here is was, uh, that uh, if you uh, look at the standard model from perturbative point of view, then uh, you find out that baryon number is conserved there. Only if you take into account non-perturbative corrections, non-perturbative effects, you find out that uh, uh, there are processes with baryon number uh, non-conservation. So zero temperatures, that was established by Tooft, and then at finite temperature, it was uh, uh, in our work. So basically what uh, you see is that uh, uh, at huge interval of temperatures from the 100 GeV to the 10 to the 12 GeV, the processes with uh, thermal, uh, with very number non-conservation, ion thermal equilibrium, and uh, very rapid. Uh, well, this is actually uh, 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 the title of our paper. I just uh, want to see uh, that my affiliation at that time was uh, Trieste. Uh, so why it's so? It goes uh, out of physics, uh, of course. But uh, in Soviet Union at that time, 85, when you submit a paper for publication, every paper has to go through censorship, central censorship. So what you do? You fill out the forms, uh, every author has, has to sign, that uh, the paper they are submitting for the publication contains nothing new, and in particular nothing which could damage the uh, uh, Soviet Union. Okay, so you uh, fill this form, you uh, submit, uh, uh, you get five signatures, you fill this form by hand, you submit it to censorship, after two months, you get uh, the answer. Okay, yes, no. And there was a way uh, to go around that. So what you do, you uh, have your handwritten uh, draft of the paper, and if you travel abroad, and I went abroad at that time to visit ICTP, uh, you smuggle your manuscript through Soviet customs because if you are caught, <laughs> it's not a good thing for you. <laughs> that perhaps would be the last <laughs> time you <laughs> admitted to go abroad. <laughs> and uh, then you submit this paper uh, uh, from this place. And so in me, uh, this was from, I was in CTP, and then the, the same tricks were done with Valeri and uh, Vadim. They were doing the same with other papers. Okay, uh, so anyway, uh, let's look at uh, baryon asymmetry uh, of the universe uh, in the standard model. Uh, so potentially it can be generated, uh, all Sakharov conditions are satisfied, uh, we have CP violation because of uh, uh, K mesons. 
uh, this is experimentally uh, uh, true. We have baryon number non-conservation because of sphaleron transitions, and then we have non-equilibrium because uh, the universe is expanding. So there are deviations from thermal equilibrium. Uh, actually, no true computation was done for this standard model, though technology is very well uh, incorporated, uh, is very well uh, developed. Uh, but kind of there is no point to, to do this computation because you look at different factors which should appear in in uh, in this computation. So the final result it should be proportional to the measure of CP violation. It should uh, take into account different deviations from thermal equilibrium. So if you uh, 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 find out the measure of CP violation. Uh, then it contains a lot of different factors, kabayashi maskawa angles, etc., etc., uh, and it contains uh, different masses of quarks. So uh, this formula is, uh, yeah, is more or less okay. Uh, if you combine all these factors which you know, mass of top quark, of bottom quark, etc., you get 10 to the minus 20. You want to get 10 to the minus 10. You are missing. Uh, 10 orders of magnitude, why bother to do uh, an honest computation? Uh, <laughs> so uh, the fact that uh, this number is so small uh, motivated uh, many people, well, including myself, to, uh, to search for um, some enhancement of, uh, uh, of CP violation. Okay, at that time, uh, around that, there were no any signs of new physics. Okay? There were no neutrinos, uh, uh, so the standard model uh, uh, was looking very good, okay, not broken. And then uh, there were different attempts that, okay, we have small number, but we have a large factor, M Planck over MW, universe uh, expanded. Uh, a long time, maybe that leads to uh, some enhancement of that. No, it doesn't work. Uh, then there was in, uh, the work uh, which uh, Glenus Farrar and I was doing, uh, which happened to be not correct because uh, collisions in the plasma destroy coherence. Uh, uh, well, anyway, there were uh, different attempts. There were even attempts uh, quite recently, which also don't work. So I would say that uh, the standard model uh, barogenesis, it lived for some time. But uh, now uh, we can uh, say that no standard model cannot do the job. Okay? So we cannot do the job. And so uh, we have to look for some uh, modifications of the standard model. Uh, which uh, can accommodate uh, baryon asymmetry of the universe. And I, I think that that's an important uh, uh, statement because then we know that the standard model is not complete. Uh, there should be uh, something else. So, uh, baryogenesis opens a window to new physics. However, uh, uh, I would say that this window is wide open because uh, there is just one number to explain. Uh, and here I say that epistemology tells that the number of theories which you can invent is some constant divided by the number of data points to some power. I'm not sure that epistemology tells that, so this is my own formula. <laughs> I don't know what are these constants, but it kind of uh, looks uh, intu intuitively correct. If you want to explain just one thing, then you may get uh, uh, many, many uh, explanations. And if you want to explain many things at once, then uh, the number of theories which uh, can do so uh, get in small. Okay, so uh, it would be nice to make uh, our search for uh, physics beyond the standard model somewhat narrow. Okay, and so uh, it would be nice to add some data points, quote unquote, uh, which mm, tell us that the standard model is not complete, and maybe combining all these things together, uh, we can uh, get a better uh, explanation or better understanding what uh, uh, new physics uh, could be. 
And uh, uh, let me go through a uh, few other uh, indications then the standard model is, uh, is not complete and uh, should be extended. Uh, so one of them uh, actually comes from uh, neutrino physics. Okay. Uh, there, there was uh, uh, already a long time ago uh, an indication that uh, this neutrino have masses. Okay. So, so there was a long-standing uh, problem associated with solar neutrinos. If you uh, take a solar model and uh, compute out of the solar model how many neutrinos can reach you on the Earth, you get one number, you measure this number, you get less. Okay? So some neutrinos seem to disappear, and the uh, possibility to, <coughs> to explain that is to say that neutrinos have masses. Okay? Uh, then there was uh, another uh, indication, again, from neutrino physics coming from atmospheric neutrinos, in which uh, 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 you have the following uh, phenomenon. Uh, there are cosmic rays approaching uh, the Earth. These cosmic rays, they hit uh, atmosphere. And once they hit atmosphere, uh, they create pi, uh, pi mesons, pi plus, pi minus. And again, you can compute uh, the number of uh, expected neutrinos. Uh, from this process, and again, this number was different from what uh, uh, you observe. Okay, so that is another indication for uh, non-zero masses. Okay, uh, and if you take the canonical standard model, uh, then the neutrinos they have uh, zero mass. Why? Because in canonical standard model, uh, neutrinos uh, are exactly massless. So it just was constructed in, in this way. Okay, we can wonder why the standard model was constructed in this way. Uh, I think it's not written in any of the paper of the founders of the standard model why they didn't introduce right-handed neutrino to have mass. You don't find that. But I guess uh, the reason was that uh, at the time when standard model was conceived, 60s, uh, then Everybody believed that leptonic numbers are exactly conserved. And the best way to do so is to say that there are no, no right-handed neutrinos. Once you say so, that's it. Uh, the conservation of leptonic numbers is automatic. So now we know that uh, this is not true. Uh, yet another indication that the standard model is not uh, the whole story, it comes again from... Uh, well, it, it comes from cosmology, as well as uh, baryon asymmetry of the universe. Uh, we see that there is uh, uh, dark matter in the universe, and the amount of this dark matter is greater than the amount of uh, uh, ordinary matter. Well, we also have uh, dark energy. I'm not discussing here dark energy. It can be simply a cosmological constant. Maybe this is uh, maybe this looks una unnatural, but still this is a uh, possibility. Anyway, uh, the standard model it doesn't have any uh, candidate for uh, dark matter particle, and uh, therefore extension of the standard model is uh, is required. Uh, so we have kind of three uh, data points uh, which we want to, uh, to explain, and we want to, to get them together. One is baryon asymmetry of the universe, neutrino masses, and uh, dark matter. Uh, so what is, let's start from neutrino masses. This is kind of most robust uh, thing which uh, we see in our terrestrial experiments, in, in, in laboratory experiments. Uh, there is an effective way of in introducing neutrino masses in uh, the standard model. Uh, you take Lagrangian of the standard model, you add to this Lagrangian all higher order operators suppressed by uh, some new scale. Okay? Uh, there is uh, a specific operator which is written here. It's called the uh, Weinberg operator since Weinberg uh, first introduced it. And uh, this operator contains Higgs field two times and then it contains uh, leptonic fields. And so if uh, Higgs field has a vacuum expectation value, then uh, this term leads to uh, Majorana neutrino masses. 
Okay, and so if you add uh, this operator to the standard model, you explain all phenomena in neutrino physics. Okay, except few anomalies, uh, which are uh, not 100% uh, 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 true. Okay, you look at that, you say, well, uh, this is non renormalizable theory. It's better have uh, something uh, renormalizable. Uh, uh, so this is a Weinberg operator to neutrinos, to scalar fields. And you say, well, uh, can we invent a theory in which uh, uh, the generation of neutrino masses comes from uh, renormalizable theory? And the simplest way uh, to do so is to have a new particle, right-handed neutrino. And in this way, the, uh, uh, you fill the boxes which exist uh, in the standard model. So uh, let me explain you uh, this picture. You find a picture of the standard model in Wikipedia, which is very misleading. Okay, I think this is uh, the much better picture. This is much more correct. So th this picture shows the following. Uh, so these are Higgs boson, okay, uh, transmitter of, of different interactions. And then uh, we have the left-hand side where we have different particles, but uh, there is a square for every particle. There is left-hand side of the square and right-hand side of the square. And this left-hand side of the square and right-hand side of the uh, square say that you have left-handed particles and right-handed particles. Okay, and then the standard model is um, uh, is written here, uh, all charged leptons and all quarks, they have left-handed and right-handed components, except neutrino, and so there are empty boxes. So we follow the uh, uh, advice from chemistry. If you have a periodic table of elements, like Mendeleev did, you find uh, an empty square, you just fill it with something. Okay, so let's fill uh, this uh, square with right-handed neutrinos, and let's see what, uh, uh, what we are going to get. And uh, what we are going to, to get is kind of interesting, because uh, uh, this uh, uh, type of theory actually can explain all experimental drawbacks of the standard model. It can explain uh, neutrino masses and oscillations. It can explain dark matter and also uh, baryon asymmetry uh, of the universe. So there is a part associated with cosmological inflation, which I'm not going to touch here, and it's not associated with any uh, right-handed state uh, here. Okay, so uh, I would say that uh, we may even uh, think about uh, historical analogy. So the standard model, it was uh, conceived back in uh, 67, okay? And uh, since 67, uh, it was evolving. But it was evolving in uh, the fermionic sector. If you take a uh, bosonic sector of the standard model with W and Z bosons and uh, with um, uh, the Higgs field, they were part of the standard model already from 67. Uh, the standard model which Weinberg wrote, it contained only leptons. It didn't have quarks. Okay, so the quarks were introduced later. And then uh, the number of uh, fermionic families uh, was growing. First we had uh, just uh, electron, muon, then the charm quark was uh, uh, discovered as a part of the second family, and then later tau lepton, bottom quark, and tau. And uh, it took about 20 years to find all uh, these uh, particles. And so if uh, these uh, new particles, right-handed neutrino, or how they call the heavy neutral leptons, how much time it will take to discover them, uh, if this is well, we don't know. Uh, but I will <coughs> tell you a few, few hints uh, later on. Uh, Okay, so this is the Lagrangian of uh, this theory. It contains standard model and some parts associated with uh, uh, these new particles, H and Ls. And the specific uh, uh, feature of this theory that it breaks lepton number because uh, there is uh, a mass term which is called Majorana mass term for these particles. 
And also it has uh, many new uh, Yukawa interactions, which look similar for Yukawa interactions of quarks and charged leptons. Also interactions with the Higgs field. Okay, so uh, CP violating phase, which was hidden uh, previously in Kobayashi Maskawa matrix. So here you get many more uh, CP violating phases. And uh, this is uh, interesting from the point of view of um, of baryogenesis. So once you uh, uh, write uh, this type of uh, action, of course, th the most important uh, question for physics would be uh, what kind of scale you introduce, what kind of energy scale uh, these uh, uh, new particles uh, could be. Okay. Can we answer uh, this question from available experiments? So the answer is no. Okay. Uh, what happens is that uh, uh, so this axis is uh, the mass of new particles, and this axis here is uh, the uh, amplitude of uh, Yukawa coupling. Okay, we can say okay, we take uh, neutrino physics, and from neutrino physics, perhaps uh, we can uh, get uh, uh, the mass of this new state. Can we? No. Answer is no. Uh, the reason is that uh, uh, you take this theory, you compute neutrino masses, you find that neutrino masses are Yukawa coupling square, vacuum expectation value of the Higgs square, divided by mass. And so if you scale uh, Yukawa coupling as uh, x and mass as x square, you get one and the same number. Okay, and this means that uh, neutrino physics, neutrino physics is all, is all about neutrino uh, mass matrix. Okay, you find out exactly the same. So there is a huge degeneracy. So you can uh, take the mass, which is as as large as 10 to the 10 GeV, or you can take a mass which is a fraction of electron volt, perhaps more, a little bit. And you still have an explanation of uh, uh, all neutrino physics. So there is uh, some triangle here, which looks small, but which spans many, many orders of magnitude in mass and many orders of magnitude in uh, Yukawa couplings, which uh, still explains uh, all uh, neutrino physics for you. Uh, okay, so there are uh, some uh, uh, corners. So here there is no CSO. If there is no CSO, you're in contradiction with experiment. Uh, there's a strong coupling. If you are here, the neutrino mass is too small, but uh, in this domain, uh, everything uh, works. Okay, so uh, now uh, our uh, aim was uh, to find out how uh, baron asymmetry is uh, generated in this, uh, uh, in this theory. And uh, there are two qualitatively uh, different but related uh, possibilities. So one of them is, uh, uh, can be called CISO uh, leptogenesis, and it's based on the uh, following idea. Uh, you have these new particles. Uh, this is time. Uh, this is concentration of these new particles. Uh, during evolution uh, in the universe, these particles are created, enter into thermal equilibrium, and then decay. And when they decay, they produce a lepton number, and then uh, the lepton number is uh, converted into baryon number uh, due to uh, electroweak processes. So this was invented by uh, Fukuhita and uh, Yanagida, and the machinery here is also very, very involved, but uh, uh, qualitatively, uh, you, you look at uh, decays of uh, uh, this heavy neutral leptons on a lepton and uh, uh, the Higgs field. You compute radiative corrections to that. You find out that there is, in this decays, uh, there is a, a production of net lepton asymmetry. Then you plug in, then you uh, uh, use phalerons to co convert uh, this lepton asymmetry into baryon number. Okay, and it, uh, it works very well. Uh, uh, there is another uh, incarnation of uh, leptogenesis here, which is based on Frizin. And here the picture is that uh, 
uh, again, you uh, start your universe from small uh, number of these HNLs, this number grows, and then during the time when these particles are still out of thermal equilibrium, in the processes with them, lepton asymmetry is created. And now, uh, these processes are not decays of these particles, but this is rather scattering. Okay? And uh, uh, this also works. Okay? So this uh, was uh, uh, invented by uh, Ahmedov, uh, Rubakov, and Smirnov, and then uh, Asaka and myself, uh, we also contributed to, <coughs> to that. So this is a... Uh, uh, also very well developed subject which allows you uh, to find out what is uh, the uh, baryon asymmetry of the universe uh, created here. And so this picture is just uh, show you the time evolution, how uh, uh, concentration of uh, different particles evolve. So this axis here is temperature, so temperature here is high and uh, universe evolution, we go from right to left. So uh, you see that initially the densities of these particles are small, and then at some stage they uh, reach the equilibrium uh, values. And uh, this is behavior of lepton asymmetries. Uh, the, uh, initially it is small, and then at smaller temperatures you, you, get, uh, you generate asymmetries and different flavors. And uh, the uh, similar thing happens with the uh, baryon asymmetry, okay? So the baryon asymmetry uh, increases, and here you have uh, a sphaleron switching off, and after that, this baryon asymmetry uh, stays at the level of uh, uh, 10 to the minus 10. Okay, so at first sight, uh, it looks to be that there are different mechanisms, one associated with freeze-out, another one associated with freeze-in, but uh, in reality, it happens that uh, there is uh, a continuous transition from one uh, mechanism to uh, another. Uh, both mechanisms can be analyzed with the use of the same formalism, and so in, in more general terms, uh, what uh, you can say is that, okay, you have this uh, theory, take the parameter, use your machinery, compute uh, the asymmetry, and find uh, the uh, domain of parameters which uh, can do the job, which can explain why we have uh, more uh, baryons than uh, anti-baryons, and why, uh, what should be the, the, the parameters of these uh, particles to, uh, to explain neutrino masses and uh, and baryogenesis. And, and here is uh, a result of, of this type of computation. Uh, this is uh, the uh, mass of HNL. Uh, this is the mixing angle of HNL with other particles. Uh, so this mixing angle, uh, the physical meaning of that is uh, easy to understand. Uh, this number here uh, shows the strength of interaction of these uh, particles with the rest of the world in comparison with weak interaction. So if you see here uh, number 10 to the minus 8, this means that these interactions are 8 orders of magnitude weaker than uh, the weak interactions. Okay? And so uh, you see here uh, the very small numbers for, uh, for the masses of these particles, like uh, GeV or even 100 uh, mega electron volt, you can say, well, these uh, particles, we can create them, no problem. Yes, we can, but uh, the interaction is so weak that uh, we don't see them yet. Okay. So th the same was story with neutrino. And neutrino was uh, found after uh, very non-trivial searches. Okay. So, what this picture shows that uh, uh, if you are in this domain, then you can do, uh, you can uh, have baryon asymmetry of the universe uh, 10 to the minus 10. Okay, so this uh, color code here is associated with the mass splitting between uh, two uh, heavy neutral leptons. Uh, and this picture uh, just shows that. If you think uh, that uh, the baryon asymmetry was created in freeze-in, 
and then it is uh, this domain. Uh, if freeze out, then there is this domain, but all these domains overlap, so it's better to uh, think about some common mechanism which uh, has different manifestations in different uh, parts of uh, uh, the phase space. And uh, what I added here are the sensitivities of uh, different planned experiments which uh, uh, can say to us whether uh, these particles uh, exist or not. Uh, this line uh, corresponds to uh, the experiment called the SHIP. Uh, this is a project experiment. Uh, uh, this line corresponds to a projection uh, with FCC, if it will be built. Uh, this is a future uh, circular collider, a plus or minus machine. Uh, there is uh, some part uh, which uh, can be covered, a relatively small one, with the uh, high uh, luminosity uh, LHC. Okay, and this is the similar picture for inverted hierarchy of neutrino masses. So that was a normal ordering, and this is uh, inverted uh, ordering. <laughs> okay, uh, so this is basically... Uh, the same picture which shows that uh, this is domain where neutrino masses and baryon asymmetry can be explained at once. And actually, uh, this domain continues well uh, here, so you can have uh, masses of these particles very large of the order of 10 to the 10 GeV, 10 to the 12 GeV, but everything works. Okay, so what uh, are the experimental possibilities? Uh, to find this particle here. Uh, the production of uh, uh, these particles is highly suppressed. Okay? So if you just look at uh, the vertical axis, again, this number is uh, the interaction in comparison with weak interaction. So the probability of having these uh, particles is uh, uh, very small. And then uh, there are uh, two different uh, uh, kind of mass uh, regions which require different type of uh, experiments. So the first one is the mass below uh, 5 GeV. While 5 GeV, 5 GeV is a beauty uh, quark mass. Okay, so the idea here is that you collide, uh, uh, say, protons, you produce many, uh, uh, many strongly interacting particles, beauty mesons in particular, once you have beauty mesons, this beauty meson can decay and produce uh, heavy neutral lepton for you, and you can decay, you can uh, uh, detect uh, the decays of uh, uh, heavy neutral leptons. And there are a few experiments which are uh, proposed at uh, CERN uh, SPS. Uh, ship and shadows. And if you have mass above uh, 5 GeV, then you better have a plus or minus collider which produce Z bosons and then in decay of Z bosons you can uh, have again an HNL with larger mass and you can detect uh, this uh, decays of these particles. And this is a projection of uh, different bounds uh, in a little bit uh, different form. So below you don't want to be because um, you, you cannot explain neutrino masses. There is some domain here in which existence of these uh, particles would contradict to predictions of Big Bang nuclear synthesis. Above this red line, uh, you cannot create baryon asymmetry, but there is uh, this um, uh, domain where everything can be explained, which is filled by... Uh, uh, different uh, projection of uh, different experiments. Okay, so I, I'm coming to, uh, to the end. So even in the simplest, uh, beyond the standard uh, model uh, theory, uh, it happens to be uh, very rich, and even here, uh, the, the window uh, for baryogenesis is uh, uh, wide open, okay? So perhaps this is good. 
uh, this may be good in the following sense. That uh, 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 explanation of baryon asymmetry and uh, neutrino masses are the generic uh, consequences of the theory. Okay, so you take the theory and then you generically uh, get these predictions. But maybe this is bad because uh, uh, we cannot tell our experimental colleagues, okay, search for these guys in this uh, mass interval. We cannot do so because there, is, uh, there are plenty of possibilities, uh, both baryon asymmetry of the universe and neutrino masses can be explained in a relatively wide uh, uh, domain. But I believe, so I look at that optimistically, uh, it may be very well that uh, these new particles can be uh, discovered uh, soon, uh, maybe even within my lifetime. And uh, I uh, just put here uh, some warning that uh, I discussed uh, just one uh, mechanism for uh, baryogenesis. Yeah, I started with two, but then I argued that this is just one. And uh, this is a confirmation of my epistemology formula, that <laughs> there could be many, many different mechanisms uh, which uh, uh, can explain uh, the same thing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Misha. So we have time for questions. Yeah. Hi, thanks, Misha, for the talk. Uh, sorry, I got distracted. Why is it that uh, what's the relation with the 5GV and the bottom quark? Uh, why is it that the fact that uh, 5GV is the limit is, of course, because of the bottom quark mass, but I didn't pay attention to what was the process. If you can uh, okay, repeat okay. again, please. Yeah, sure. So uh, I will uh, show some back up slides, perhaps, which can explain better uh, what, uh, mm, how these experiments are designed and, uh, and what they are doing. So, example, a ship experiment, but the idea is uh, literally the same for all uh, searches of uh, this type of particles. They actually now go under uh, the common name of FIPS, okay, feebly interacting particles. Okay, so, uh, uh, so this is uh, CERN, okay, and then uh, there is uh, an injector for LHC, which is called SPS, okay, and this is uh, an accelerator which uh, produces uh, protons, intensive beam of protons with energy uh, 400 GeV, okay. So, uh, what you do with these protons? Uh, these protons, they uh, hit uh, the target. And once uh, they hit the target, they produce different particles. And they produce different mesons. And uh, the mesons uh, SPS can produce are, of course, a lot of pies, uh, K mesons, then uh, charmed, and at the limit, beauty. They cannot produce top quarks, for instance, right? So everything is finished uh, at, at the beauty mass. Now, uh, you want to consider the following decay. So this is an example of uh, D, uh, which is charm uh, carrying stuff. So this uh, charm carrying stuff is uh, uh, decayed, okay? And uh, in the standard model, it, hand, it has uh, different uh, decay uh, modes. Uh, for instance, leptonic decay mode in which uh, uh, charged lepton and uh, neutrino are produced. But neutrinos are mixed with H and Ls, and so every decay of this sort would produce uh, uh, this particle, okay? And then uh, uh, this particle flies forward and, uh, uh, yeah, and uh, decays in some way, okay? So, for instance, uh, in this example, it decays to pi and mu. And then you can see uh, uh, this pair in your... Uh, spectrometer, okay? And then by analyzing the pairs, you can find out the vertex, you can find out the mass, etc., etc. But uh, important point here, that for all this uh, uh, to happen, uh, you must have a parent uh, meson to produce HNL, okay? And the only thing which you have at hands is the beauty, 
okay? And so uh, above beauty, you cannot go. You must produce uh, the meson first, and then in E plus and minus, you also produce a meson Z. And then uh, normally Z would decay into neutrino and antineutrino, but uh, this also means that it decays on the neutrino and HNL. And then it's exactly the same story. Uh, neutrino goes away, uh, and then HNL decays on something uh, on this way, and then you, you search for uh, this thing. And then there are different uh, uh, you know, experimental things. That you search for misplaced vertex, you know where a collision happens, but then this HNL uh, goes uh, uh, some distance and after uh, that decays. And, yeah. So suppose they find this particle. Yeah. So I understand it explains neutrino mass, but it sounds like baryogenesis, you have other hypotheses, freeze in, freeze out. I don't know exactly what that means. And another question is, couldn't it just be an initial condition that the universe started with more baryons than antibaryons? Uh -huh. uh, the first question was uh, uh, what we are going... How you prove that it's freeze in or freeze out? How do you prove that if you find this particle... Uh, okay, explains uh, suppose, uh, yeah, let's take uh, an extremely optimistic uh, scenario, okay, that uh, these particles are found. Uh, then, uh, if uh, these uh, particles are found, then you fix their mass, and then you fix their coupling, and in uh, unrealistic but extremely optimistic scenario, you find even CP violation in the interaction. Then you fix completely the theory. Yeah, and then uh, once you know the theory is, you plug in uh, your kinetic equations, whatever, and then you predict uh, the sign of baryon asymmetry and the uh, baryon asymmetry itself. Okay. Well, sorry, how do you know that it's... So if you have CP violation, you can still have CP violation now. So why is baryon... Why doesn't it just go from baryon to antibaryon, baryon to antibaryon? What, what, what fixes it to be positive baryon once you have the CP violation? So, okay, uh, so... There are, uh, uh, in interaction of, of this heavy uh, neutron leptons, there is CP violation. And imagine, as I said, this is quite unrealistic that we will be able to do so, but suppose we, we measure at all CP violating phases. Okay, so we know uh, CP violating phases and their uh, interaction exactly in the way as we know CP violating phase and interaction of hadrons. But then that's it. We have completed the theory, we can do a computation, and then we will know baryon asymmetry and its sign. I don't understand the sign. How do you get the sign if it's baryon violating? Uh, the sign is, uh, okay, the sign of, uh, uh, okay, let me give you uh, an example. Let's forget about uh, this heavy uh, neutron leptons. So let's just take CP violation, which is in uh, CKM matrix. Okay? So this CP violation in CKM matrix allows you to fix in an ambiguous way what is matter and what is antimatter. Right? Mm -hmm. It's the same there. Once you have a process which allows you to go from matter to antimatter, or antimatter to matter, why can't it flip the sign if the universe is more matter than antimatter? What, what, what tells you that there's more matter than antimatter? And why can't it continually fluctuating? Or more matter well, it's not more fluctuating. No, no, no. It's not fluctuating. Sorry? No, no, no. If, uh, uh, it's literally like, like, like that. So you know the theory. Suppose that we know the theory completely. So this means that we know every parameter in this theory, computing the, including all CP violating phases. Okay, then you do a computation. The important fact of this computation that the universe is cooling down. This is uh, the, the, the Sakharov condition. And combining the knowledge of these phases with the fact that the universe is cooling down and not compressing, okay will tell you I what understand. the sign okay. is. Okay, thanks. And uh, you had the second question. About initial condition. Yeah, Why about initial condition. Condition. Okay. Uh, 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 one can think that, yeah, maybe it's initial condition which uh, fixed uh, uh, the uh, baryon number, okay? A and you can certainly say so. But if you add some extra information, 
about the universe, this is unlikely. Why it's unlikely? Uh, the universe uh, is homogeneous and isotropic at large scales. And uh, if uh, uh, we say that this is also initial condition, then it will be in the same, uh, uh, at the same level as initial condition for, uh, for, uh, for better on the symmetry. Now, if you say, no, we want to understand why the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. Okay. Uh, if this happens because of inflation, then that's it. Initial conditions for baryon number are equal to zero. Okay, thanks. Or if you, if you say that we have uh, the theory which I just described, then in the theory which I just described, uh, the processes with, uh, there are no conservation law. Baryon number is not conserved, lepton number is not conserved. So if you put uh, some initial condition for baryon or lepton number, then everything will be erased by uh, this interaction and then it will have to appear again. But uh, uh, this is not at the theorem, mathematical theorem level, there are extra ingredients uh, inside. Thank you for the very nice talk. Um, on those plots um, of um, HNL masses versus um, mixing, uh, for example, slide uh, 38, I think, the, there's a region uh, of like neutrino masses are too small. Uh -huh. Yeah. But like this, this region seems to be shrinking for large HNL masses, but isn't the light neutrino masses inversely proportional to the HNL uh, mass? Well, I wouldn't call that as uh, shrinking or uh, not. It's, uh, it's just, uh, no, I mean, uh, neutrino masses are too small. Uh, this is the following thing. Uh, mass of uh, neutrino is, uh, uh, let me put it in this way. This is uh, 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 Dirac mass square over M, okay? And this uh, Dirac mass square is Yukawa square times uh, vacuum expectation value for the Higgs uh, square. So how this uh, uh, line neutrino masses are too small is derived. So it's derived, uh, let me uh, take away technicalities, uh, is derived in the following way. This uh, uh, mixing angle, uh, u square, is uh, nothing but md over m. Okay, uh, so this guy is, uh, uh, yeah, I guess this is theta. And uh, you know what neutrino mass is, and uh, so from here, you can draw this uh, line. It just goes in this way, okay? It continues to infinity, uh, strictly speaking. Yeah. I see. Thank you. Enrico. <laughs> You're running too much. This is probably a, a bit technical question. Uh -huh. So. A neutrino have masses, and this points towards right and the neutrino, which in turn point towards lepton number violation. When, so lepton number is probably violated. Uh, baryon number is probably also violated. Now, in the standard model, as you have shown, uh, the, the real big problem is uh, not enough CP violation. Yeah. Because the scalar sector, maybe with a little addition, you could also change the order of the phase transition. But now, if we have lepton number and baryon number violation, the standard model is an additional source of CP violation, which is uh, uh, the, the vacuum angle of uh, SU2. So my question is, why, uh, for as far as I know, this has not been uh, used uh, or nothing has been built up with this additional source of CP violation, which is embedded in the standard model under mm -hmm. those two conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, so <laughs> uh, the question was about a strong CP violation, right? Or not? No, 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 that's your two tangle. Oh. 
sorry, weak? Uh, the weak theta angle. Ah, there is no weak theta. Uh, no, no, there is. Uh, under the, uh, if you have a, le uh, the, the, the weak theta angle can be removed because uh, you have B, okay, L, B okay, plus L violation. Okay, yeah, 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 I see. Uh, B plus L symmetry, anomalous. Yes, yes, yes. But if it is explicitly broken, then uh, the theta uh, angle is... Uh, yes, yes, yes. Of okay. is physical. Uh, sure, 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 sure. Yeah, okay. uh, absolutely true. For the standard model, SU2 theta angle is not physical, but if you introduce uh, right-handed uh, leptons, uh, this... It's most uh, likely it this, is This uh, uh, angle will be physical. Okay. Yes. So the CPR vi violation associated with this uh, theta angle at uh, zero temperatures uh, would be out because out. this is uh, suppressed by uh, by phalerons. Yeah, it to the minus uh, angle. You have uh, uh, this uh, CP angle. I. Uh, Indeed, this was not uh, studied. However, uh, what was what was studied, and here I remember the answer because um, we did that together with Larry McLaren and Emil Mottel and myself. We looked at what uh, happened, uh, what happens with. Uh, with strong CP violation at, uh, at high temperatures, okay? Uh, uh, this is not related to baryogenesis, but, no, but no, we okay. still uh, can ask uh, the question uh, whether, uh, theta suppose QCD. that there is a theta QCD, yeah. uh, whether theta QCD is important uh, at, uh, at high temperatures, okay? And uh, what we found there is that the answer is that it's not important. And the reason is that even at high temperatures, the processes which break uh, uh, CP because of this uh, theta angle are suppressed by the instantons. And these instantons are finite temperature instantons and they have uh, large action. So in spite of the fact that uh, the, the processes, like here, as phaleron processes, they are very, very rapid, these are classical prop uh, they're essentially classical mm -hmm. properties, and uh, uh, quantum physics is not uh, relevant. So uh, theta, which leads to CP violation, is associated with instantons rather than with phalerons. So that, that's a very uh, interesting question. Okay, I, uh, to tell you the truth, I didn't think about that at all. And so what I'm saying is kind of what... Yeah, it's different, no, uh, because the in... Uh, of, of my mind. In SU2, you... you yeah, you know. yeah, yeah, but... Uh, so I was, there must be, I was thinking there is probably an obvious reason why people didn't waste time to no, do no, that, no, but, but, uh, but I cannot see that. But uh, w what we did see, and I believe that this uh, also true for uh, SU2, so if you look at uh, high temperatures and look at really CP violation associated with theta angle, then this is not phalerons but instantons. Yeah, yeah, this instantons I understood. Are still uh, suppressed at. Uh, yeah, at but high around the phase transition uh, could, could go. Uh, okay, I I, okay, uh, I, I don't think I can insist now at this answer. We can but discuss okay. that, that. That thank was, you. Uh, So the, the other motivation for uh, physics beyond the standard model is the hierarchy problem. But here in your talk, I, I didn't see that word at all. So are those yeah. like orthogonal directions, or are these models natural? Uh, well, uh, I'm in the camp of people who do not believe in hierarchy problem and the naturalness. Okay, and I explain, I can explain why. In the discussion session. <laughs> yes. um, I have two questions, if I'm allowed. So um, the, the, the first one is: uh, um, you said we do not observe antimatter in the universe, but could there be antimatter outside the observable uh, radius? Is yeah. it possible, or is it excluded? This is a metaphysical question. <laughs> if something is behind the horizon, we have no idea what happens there. But okay. Maybe there is antimatter, I don't know. Maybe there are some other uh, exotic animals uh, living there. No, yeah, we don't know. 
But could it, could it be like in the, some inflation scenario? We, we, we have some. Yeah, yeah. So, for, for instance, one of the uh, possibilities which are uh, discussed along this line is um, uh, that, uh, okay, that which is, um, so what's the name to the uh, multiverse, okay? So you say that your uh, theory is uh, very, very complicated. It has many different uh, vacuum. The physics in different vacuum of this theory is completely different. And uh, uh, inflation just selected one particular piece, patch of, of this vacuum, and maybe somewhere behind horizon, uh, there is no electroweak theory. There is something else. Uh, yeah, th that could be very well the case, but. Uh, it's uh, difficult to approach this question okay. mm, from observations. Well, unless it happens that because of some reason, the domain of our physics is of the order of horizon, and maybe in the next uh, billion years, we will see uh, some patch of the uh, other world uh, uh, which will be available uh, for our observations. But and uh, uh, my, my second question is about the dark matter. So you, you, you said that it can explain dark matter. Mm -hmm. If you uh, can comment uh, a little bit. And also, could you constrain the mass of this uh, uh, NHL particle with observations of uh, uh, dark yeah. structures? Yeah, I, mm, uh, well, I can flash a few slides uh, uh, here, if I have them. Yes, so one of the, uh, for uh, this discussion, neutrino masses and baryon asymmetry, only two HNLs were essential. So if you have two HNLs, two, two heavy neutral leptons, you can explain all neutrino physics and baryon asymmetry of the universe. So you have one more if you want to fill these gaps, and uh, this one more can be used for dark matter explanation. Okay, and uh, this uh, dark matter candidate is called the uh, sterile neutrino uh, dark matter, and uh, it is present everywhere in the universe, and it has a specific signature because uh, this particle can decay into neutrino and gamma, and the way to discover this particle is to find out a narrow line coming from uh, this two-body decay. Okay, and that uh, can be done in, uh, in X-ray uh, telescopes, which are uh, uh, far away. And uh, no, I don't have a slide. Actually, there is uh, one uh, very important satellite flying right now. Okay. It was uh, launched uh, in September this year, uh, which is called uh, uh, CRISM. That's a Japanese satellite. Uh, so uh, it uh, is going to study X-ray structure of the universe and in particular look for different lines, if it will find some line that may be a discovery of, uh, of a dark matter particle. Okay. But, but there is, again, the whole machinery here. You put this theory in the early universe, you compute the abundance, uh, and you try to get different constraints which are partially present in this, uh, in this figure. Okay, so I don't see any other uh, questions. So I guess with three uh, right-handed neutrinos, you can solve almost all the problems of the universe, except dark energy, maybe. Except, well, dark energy, uh, you add cosmological constant, <laughs> that's <it>. and that's, <laughs> it. <laughs> that's it. That's it. And also, if you want to know a little bit more about barogenesis, we have this school coming, uh, happening right now. It extends to next week also. So there are 30 other models that you can learn about. Yes. And uh, so uh, just reminding you that we're going to have the uh, picture uh, of the school uh, now outside. So let's thank Misha again for this very nice uh, talk. Thank you.